Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you so much for being here for patient confidentiality is an RJ issue. Um, I want to just really, uh, as we start, thank um, the organizers and give a big thank you to my co-panelists. And I also want to thank Jules, who's going to give us a quick uh, security announcement. Hi, everyone. Okay, welcome, welcome. So my piece is just, before we begin, um, just laying down some ground rules. Um, the people speaking today have taken time out of their day to present, and we just ask that you be really respectful of everyone's voice and their time. Please don't interrupt, and please hold all questions until the presenters have invited you to do so. And if anyone has any questions they'd like to address, um, feel free to message me. You can message me privately in the chat and just select my name, or you can privately address the chat um, to any other person that you'd like. Um, and then if there are any safety or security issues that you feel that you need to bring up, again, feel free to message me. Thank you for having me and I look forward to to hearing everything. Thanks for being here, Jules. All right. So I want to take just a minute to introduce my amazing co-panelists. So um, Dr. Parrott, do you want to say hi to everybody? Hi, everybody. Thank you so much uh, to, to all of to Ianka and Jules for all of your help. Um, I'm excited to be here and to join the panelists. And Ali, do you want to say hi? Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Alejandra, pronouns she and hers. Um, great to join you all here today and talk about this very important, important subject. Awesome. Thank you so much. And my name is Lauren. Um, I am Research Counsel at Ipwin Howe, coming to you from Piscataway land in DC. And I will turn it over to Dr. Parrott, who's going to be um, our first presenter today. Thank you, Lauren, for that welcome. Thank you all for being here, for joining us, for taking time out of your day um, to be with us. It's really wonderful to be able to share this virtual space with you all. Um, as I mentioned when I said hello, my name is Dr. Jamila Parrott. I use she, her pronouns, and I actually wear lots of different hats and work in lots of different spaces, including as an abortion provider um, and as an advocate and activist in the reproductive health rights and justice spaces. And, most recently as the president and CEO of Physicians for Reproductive Health. Um, PRH is a physician-led advocacy organization that mobilizes the medical community, educating and organizing providers using medicine and science to advance access to reproductive health for all people. We're grounded in the belief that we as physician providers have an opportunity, but most importantly an obligation to leverage the privilege that our white coats provide to center those that we care for in our work and in our advocacy to shape policy and practice and legislation, knowing that these things often impact and really uh, frequently dictate the care we can provide. Um, part of the work that we do at PRH is to advocate for access to comprehensive reproductive health, including abortion care. And as an organization, uh, we are, as are many other provider organizations, thinking about ways to protect access to abortion inside and outside the clinics. And that includes understanding the reasons why someone may want or need to self-manage their abortion and how we as healthcare providers can support um, that decision. I think to get us started though, it's important to be clear about what we're talking about when we use the phrase self-managed abortion or uh, SMA is the way we describe it in shorthand. So self-managed abortion really is just a practice of ending a pregnancy uh, without the formal supervision of a healthcare provider. And so this includes uh, through the use of medications, um, like the ones we're already familiar with um, because we use them for medication abortion. So mifeprostone and mesoprostol, either together or um, alone. But it also includes the use of other medicines, herbs, tinctures, or other methods uh, that an individual may choose. And some of these methods have been studied more in academic settings, like the medications I mentioned, and others have been used in community 
and in other places around the world for many, many years. Um, but we in the United States have less data on it. It's really not an easy thing to, to gauge the extent to which people are self-managing their abortion precisely because it occurs outside of the formal healthcare system. But when we count, but whether we can count the absolute number of people who self-manage or attempt to self-manage or not, we know that it's happening. And we also know that the numbers um, seem to be increasing uh, and it's not hard to figure out why. If we just look at what's happening inside the formal healthcare system, we know that abortions are one of the most commonly performed procedures in the United States. And based on most recent data by Guttmacher, there are um, a little over 100, I'm sorry, 850,000 abortions each year. And then about 70,000 people seek abortion care each month. And we know that the need for abortion crosses race and ethnicity, income, socioeconomic status and gender identity, but people who have abortions are disproportionately those with low incomes. And we know that three quarters or 75% of these folks seeking abortions report having an income at or below the federal poverty level. And we also know that those that are seeking clinic-based abortion care um, also face numerous barriers in accessing that care, including legislative restrictions and financial obstacles and social stigma. Barriers to accessing abortion care are even steeper for people of color, for young people, undocumented people, and other historically marginalized communities. And these barriers are really compounded when there are delays in care because the pregnancy continues to advance and so the cost of care continues to advance as well and to go up. So a lot of people have to pay out of pocket for their care either because their abortion isn't covered by insurance or they're not able to use their insurance. And so then as they work to raise money for the, for the abortion, then more and more delays occur. And as delays increase, the cost of care increases. We know that there are lots of logistical challenges as well. So thinking about things like travel and childcare and navigating things like lost wage, if you have to take time off from work, the need to have a place to stay if you have to travel and all of that causes increasing delays. And so all of these things, and the reason why I bring these barriers up is because given the political climate and we've seen access to clinic-based care continue to decrease, there've been more and more studies showing that in those environments with decreased access to clinic-based care, there's an increased likelihood of interest in or attempts to self-manage one's own abortion. Next slide. But it's important to understand that decreased clinic-based access isn't the only reason why somebody might manage their own abortion. So for some people, clinic-based care may be accessible, but may not be available to them or even acceptable to them, right? And so thinking about if you have um, an abortion provider or an abortion clinic in, in your city or your town or your state, um, but maybe you know your family knows the healthcare provider or maybe you're a minor and you need your state has parental notification or consent laws, and that's not, um, and that becomes a barrier for you being able to access care. So it's not that there's not a place you can go, um, but the availability isn't there for you. Um, also, you know, really understanding what it means to seek care at an abortion clinic and how that may not feel safe uh, to many people. One of the biggest questions that I get from providers is whether or not self-managed abortion is quote unquote safe. And to them, I usually respond as compared to what, right? So it's important for us to understand that clinics and hospitals and health centers aren't always safe spaces for people and healthcare providers aren't always safe people um, for those seeking care. And for some individuals managing their abortion at home in their own community with people that they trust is a much safer option. Next slide. The next question typically with that in mind as a clinic-based abortion provider myself is how do I think about and how do I understand what our role is in supporting people however and wherever they decide to manage their own care outside of the health center, whether we're talking about abortion care or otherwise. And I think about it in three ways, right? Working towards ending the criminalization of those 
who want or need to self-manage their abortion, understanding and implementing a harm reduction framework um, in approaching self-managed abortion, and then also working towards normalization of the practice more broadly. And we're gonna spend some time when Lauren rejoins uh, the panel um, right after this to hear more from her and the folks at If When How regarding the law and how it's been used to punish those who are managing their own abortion. But one of the things that I want you to take in to that piece of the conversation, something that I think is critical for us to understand is that for those individuals who have been criminalized, who've been interrogated, arrested, and prosecuted for suspicion of self-managed abortion, it's more often than not because they interacted with the healthcare system or a healthcare provider that then notified law enforcement. And so from the provider standpoint, whether it was a malicious intent to cause harm or not for me is irrelevant because the impact is profound for the individual and for their family. The harm is profound. And certainly there's some providers who are calling law enforcement and notifying the police um, with the deliberate attempt to, to criminalize and to punish um, the individual for having an abortion, but there are others who are just really confused about what the responsibility is. And the reason why is because providers and social workers and, and people that are working within these systems are caught up in the misinterpretation or misunderstanding regarding mandatory reporting laws. And I know that this is going to come back and Lauren will give you the legal framework, but in general, the term mandatory reporting really refers to any type of situation where a person has a legal obligation to report an event or an issue to authorities. And one of the most common forms of this requirement and one that most people are most familiar with is the mandatory reporting laws dealing with situations of abuse. And so they indicate that an adult, especially a person who has um, certain responsibilities like teachers or doctors or government employees have to report a situation where they believe a child or um, someone who is vulnerable uh, is a victim of abuse, right? But there are other types of mandatory reporting laws also, right? Like company policies and other situations, right? Um, in many areas, for example, doctors and nurses are required to report to the police the identity of a person who's treated for a gunshot wound. And this is done um, with the intention of providing law enforcement personnel with suspects who may have been injured um, when fleeing police or to help assure that the assault is then reported to the police, right? But we know that that has long-term consequences as well. In this case, similarly, medical professionals are required to report this suspicion or presence of, uh, um, of other kinds of things to the government agencies, uh, things like diseases and illnesses so that they can do quarantine. The point though is as a result of these laws, some providers are confused and default to calling the police and law enforcement for everything with the belief that then law enforcement will sort it out later. The problem of course is that at that point the damage is done. And so despite what we're taught in medical school or our individual training programs, calling the police on a patient is not an innocuous act without any long-term consequences. And in fact, it has devastating effects. And I can't say this enough, it's actually not supported by the law and is in misalignment with the medical provider's responsibilities to protect patient confidentiality in this case. And so as I mentioned, Laura will go, <clears throat> Lauren will go through this in greater detail, right? Thinking about the next piece is harm reduction, for example. This is a framework that we use in lots of public health spaces where we're talking about how we can mitigate the um, consequences of an act we cannot stop. And in this case, we're thinking, we're assuming that the person is gonna engage in um, managing their own abortion, whether we support them or not. So from the provider side, how can we make sure that they don't have any unforeseen consequences, right? So if they have heavy bleeding, if they're not sure how far the pregnancy is, if they need other support, either before, during, or after the self-managed abortion, then the healthcare provider is providing that support. And so that's one other way to think about the provider's role. Um, but for me, normalization really is the way to really think about this care, because I asked what would it look like if we actually normalize a self-managed abortion process? So not as a either you go to a clinic or you manage your own abortion, 
right? So it's not instead of clinic-based care, but as an option for those who want or need it, right? Could we move toward normalizing the practice in some way in the same way that we think about normalizing other self-care practices? But the point really is wherever you land on the spectrum, whether you're just comfortable as a provider saying, well, we don't want people to be arrested or jailed for self-managing their care, or I'm gonna help folks either before, after, or during their self-managed abortion in case they want or need additional support or moving toward um, normalization of the practice. The bottom line really is that calling law enforcement because of your suspicion is not the solution. And as healthcare providers, really, we really have to work to actively interrupt this long held practice of healthcare providers calling the law enforcement, knowing that it ultimately criminalizes the patients that we care for. And so we have to take this time to uh, consider the real impact of our actions inside our, our healthcare systems and also outside. Next slide. And so as we consider our commitment to care as providers, because that's why we came to the work, you know, with a desire to heal and to treat and to help, we also have to acknowledge that our work is shaped by the context um, that we live in and that our patients live in. And so we can't ignore the social, political, and historical context, including the increased likelihood of criminalizing some communities and not others. Um, we can't just say, well, we don't know that this is happening. We can't be responsible for folks once they enter the system, um, knowing that this is causing oppression for many individuals, right? And so the call to healthcare providers is to really consider what um, non-collusion looks like, right? What does resistance look like in our healthcare systems? What could it mean for us um, and for our systems when those of us with the most power often in these systems as healthcare providers refuse to participate in criminalizing those we care for and claim to care about. And so for me, that shows up in real time, like living the values that brought us to this work. It means trusting, really trusting the patients that we care for to know what they want, when they, need, when they want it, what they need when they need it and how they need it. And understanding that all of our work in this space has to be grounded in agency and autonomy and self-determination. Um, and so thinking about what meaningful clinic-based access looks like and also what um, supported and facilitated self-managed abortion looks like for those who want it and, and need it. Next slide. So thank you guys so much for your time. Thank you all. I'll turn it over to Lauren now who will give us more of the legal framework. Thank you so much, Dr. Parrott. All right. So hi again, everyone. Um, my name is Lauren. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a research counsel at If, When, How. I'm based in Washington, DC, and though I grew up in Missouri, and there's a GIF on the screen of Ellie from, um, what is it called? Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt um, at a candy store saying that she's having candy for dinner. And uh, I just posted that because I think that it's a funny thing that describes my current life right now, post Halloween, uh, if you want a little insight into how I am dealing with stress these days. And so I won't read um, this whole slide to you, but this slide has um, an image of two people um, against the background of If When How's colors, which are green, blue, and yellow. And If When How is a national organization that works mainly with law students, lawyers, and legal professionals to train folks to approach the law via the reproductive justice framework, meaning that we want the folks we organize and work with to acknowledge intersectionality, to collaborate across movements and disciplines, and work to make the legal system suck less for the people who are forced to interact with it and how to use legal tools as harm reduction when and where we are able to do so. And we do all this in pursuit of each person's ability to decide if, when, and how to define, create, and sustain their families. And I realized I forgot to describe myself. Um, so I am a white woman, I have dark brown hair, I have on red glasses, and I have a red lip as all three of our panelists <laughs> unexpectedly did today. So this slide is about why we do this work. Um, and there are photos of two articles, one in The Guardian that says Purvi Patel has 20 year sentence for inducing own abortion reduced and one in 
one in Slate that says Georgia woman charged with murder for taking abortion pill could face the death penalty. So one of If One House strategic initiatives is self-managed abortion, and I want to spend just a little bit of time telling you why that is. There have been a number of public charges and arrests for self-managed abortion, including several in recent years. If One How does not believe that people should be criminalized for their pregnancy outcomes, and so we work on self-managed abortion from a number of angles. We have a helpline for anyone who has questions about self-managed abortion, um, also called SMA, as Jamila mentioned. We do research and education, which I'm a part of, that helps to ensure that um, folks, especially healthcare providers, understand that SMA is not reportable. And part of that work focuses on what is reportable so that if someone presents with an SMA, healthcare providers know what they do need to report and why SMA isn't and shouldn't be a part of that for health privacy reasons. We also work on policy solutions to repeal laws that could be used to criminalize pregnant people. And we have a litigation team that helps provide advocacy and representation for people who are criminalized for ending their own pregnancy. So from the outset, I want to make sure to lift up these three main takeaways. Um, we will talk more in depth about them as I go along, but these are the three main things I want you to take away from the presentation. First, there's no law in any state that requires a mandatory reporter to report a person who may have self-managed an abortion to law enforcement. And that is according to the research that we have done so far. A medical provider who reports a patient for SMA, we think could be violating HIPAA as well as state-based medical privacy laws. Secondly, though, there are some old pre-Roe laws on the books that ban self-managed abortion. We don't believe that anyone can legitimately charge a person for self-managing their own abortion. And that doesn't mean that prosecutors haven't done this very thing and applied old laws or inapplicable statutes to the situation in order to charge someone who self-manages with a crime, including very recently. So I do wanna be clear that SMA has legal risks and we think it's totally bogus for prosecutors to be charging people for self-managing. Mandatory reporting has been shown to frequently do more harm than good by separating families, traumatizing children, and ending or disrupting state benefits for families. So I just want to talk a little bit about criminalization. So on the screen, there's an arrow with three boxes that say it's discriminatory, it's discretionary, and it's circumstantial. And under it's discriminatory, we have race, poverty, gender, disability, participating in informal economies, under its discretionary, we have statutes, constitution, local police, prosecutorial discretion, social workers, and then under its circumstantial, we have fetal remains, medical emergencies, medical providers, and other participants. And what all of that means is that there are really disproportionate charges and arrests for self-managed abortion for Black, Indigenous, and people of color, for people who are low income, for women, for people who have disabilities, and for people who are participating in informal economies like sex work. And we also, when we say discretionary, we mean that the people involved in charging someone for self-managed abortion, from the initial reporters to the prosecutor themselves, are typically doing this because, as Jamila mentioned, because they can or because they think they should. They're confused about what they need to do and not because they're required to. However, I do want to point out that we would consider a number of cases of SMA criminalization to be politically motivated, meaning that people may report and or pursue charges for SMA because they are against abortion in general and do not think that people should be allowed to have an abortion at all, regardless of type. Criminalization is also circumstantial, meaning that although many people self-manage their own care, the reasons that people are charged with self-managed abortion or other crimes that prosecutors unfairly linked to that are frequently linked to things like medical emergencies, exposure to mandatory reporters, or in some cases because people dispose of fetal remains improperly. So we keep using this term mandatory reporting, but I want to make sure folks understand what that is. And this slide has a photo of, um, it's an artist real illustration actually of Lady Justice. And she has her blindfold on, but she's peeking out with one eye and she's holding the scales of justice, but they are unbalanced. And uh, I picked that because I think that it indicates that the law is very biased and it's not blind as um, people like to say. So mandatory reporting as Dr. Parrott mentioned can refer to a state law or policy. 
And the things that I'm focused on in this presentation are state laws and policies, but I also want to note that sometimes hospitals or institutions have their own policy above and beyond what the state policy is. And that's sometimes where we get into trouble because we've seen hospitals um, with policies like anytime someone comes in with a self-managed abortion, you immediately call the police, which is not required under state law. It's just something that the hospital decided that they wanted to put in place. So obviously that's very problematic and we're hoping to work with providers to ferret those out and see where they are so that we can make sure and end that practice. And then mandatory reporting is different from permissive reporting. I also wanted to point out that um, sometimes folks like, for example, domestic violence advocates are just encouraged to report, but they're not required by state law to report things. And all states have some form of mandated reporting, even if that's just limited to child abuse. And we know that both class and race bias exist in mandated reporting. In particular, I wanna name that Black and Native American families are disproportionately reported for child abuse and neglect, even though the rates of child abuse are similar across racial lines. Black children are twice as likely to be reported and are much more likely to be removed from their homes. Native American children are reported at three times the rate of white children and are also more likely to be removed. And additionally, many mandatory reporting laws ask reporters to look out for quote unquote suspected abuse. We know that the term and the action of suspecting abuse is ultimately subjective, meaning that it depends on the person. So for example, I may see a child's bruise and suspect or assume that they got it playing and another person might see the same bruise and suspect or assume abuse. Similar differences could exist in observing a change in a child's behavior or their appearance. Our suspicions really are based on inherent biases that we already hold. So that makes child abuse statutes in particular very tricky to navigate both for us and for the authorities in charge of enforcing them. And we want to keep our eyes open about the fact that getting the police and child welfare involved in people's lives where they weren't there before can be both disruptive and harmful, particularly where people hold identities that are already at increased risk of harm from police and child welfare involvement. And Ollie's going to talk a little bit more about this um, whenever her presentation is up. I do want to mention, though, that um, for example, we know that um, even though they're not supposed to, sometimes child welfare uses the fact that someone is a victim of domestic violence against them. Um, and once they're involved, it's very likely that the child will exclusively see one or both parents in a foster or a supervised setting. So that can mean effectively eliminating one or both parents from a child's life in most meaningful ways. And I would love it. I know we don't have a ton of folks on the webinar, but if there are folks who have seen um, risks that you've, that you've seen in your work, around bringing police or child welfare into a situation, even if the workers or officers are well-meaning, I'd love to see folks pop those into the chat because I think that there's probably gonna be some similarities across what we've seen in our work. And this slide um, is titled Mandatory Reporting and it has a photo of a medical symbol. It's the one with the like straight line with wings and two snakes um, in, in entwined on the straight line. And then it's sort of underlaid or overlaid on the um, scales of justice. Um, so it has two scales balancing on either end of the wings. So I know that some of you are medical or legal professionals in addition to advocates, but I do wanna make sure and communicate where we think the lines are between giving legal and medical advice and simply sharing information or helping someone work through a decision. So medical advice looks like telling someone what they should do in order to address a medical issue. It does not look like describing what happens during an abortion, whether clinical or self-managed, and it does not look like helping someone weigh how they're feeling about their pregnancy. Similarly, legal advice looks like telling anyone what they should do in a legal situation, and it does not look like helping someone go through generalized abstract hypotheticals or sharing general knowledge about the law itself. So for example, telling someone that SMA is not a crime is not legal advice. And because SMA is not a crime, the law does not prohibit us from sharing general information about SMA. You can look at our website at If When How's website, the Repro Legal Helpline, um, in order to see examples of what type of information we can freely share. And as just one more example, it would be legal advice for me to tell someone like a community-based abortion provider exactly what that person should do in order to avoid running afoul of the law in their state. It would not be legal advice for me to share with that person what I know about the law in general or to answer any questions about the law. 
So applying the law to a set of facts is when you start practicing. So in that vein, letting someone know what a healthcare provider may be required to report is not legal or medical advice. And it may be one of the questions that they have. I'm still doing research on these and I haven't gotten to all 50 states, but I'm very hopeful that next year we can begin to release state specific resources on mandatory reporting that will clarify exactly what the obligations are and risks of non-compliance. So in a majority of all states, um, in a majority of or all states, we see um, reporting requirements for things like communicable disease, certain injuries, abortion, though I want to make sure and note that abortion reporting is supposed to be anonymous, right? We know that that's hard in things like small towns, but um, the forms that providers use are supposed to use a patient number and not their name anywhere. Um, also, fetal death is a, is a a reporting requirement in a majority of states, child and vulnerable adult abuse and self-harm. And then in some states we see some crime reporting is required, overtose reporting, domestic violence or sexual assault, and statutory rape. So I want to get into some common concerns, but I'm worried that I'm running behind time. So I'm just going to skip ahead and hopefully we can come back to this if we have time um, in the question section. So my overall point is please check with an attorney in your state about all of these things and understand that most attorneys are going to advise you to be overly conservative because they don't want you to sue them. So this especially applies to any attorneys employed by a hospital who are trying to protect the hospital and its doctors from lawsuits. They're not as, as much trying to protect patient privacy. And remember too that sometimes there are penalties for a willing failure to report meaning that someone intentionally doesn't make a report even though they were certain that they should. And there can be penalties for over-reporting, which can be a HIPAA violation or a violation of state privacy law, as is the case we think in reporting SMA. So just remember, check with an attorney in your state if you're worried about any of these things. Um, and I also wanna let folks know that we do have a helpline, a legal helpline, um, reprolegalhelpline.org. Um, that's a confidential resource, it's free, um, and it exists in order to provide information on SMA and on folks' rights. Um, so I also put my email up on the screen and I'm available for general questions on mandatory reporting. Again, can't give specific legal advice, um, but we're hoping to release some state-based resources next year. And this slide has um, an image that's blue background and it has black text that says questions about your legal rights and self-managed abortion. And then it has a legal arrow point or a legal arrow, a red arrow pointing to the words talk to people you can trust if one has symbol and it has a little phone down at the bottom um, next to the text that I said earlier. So thank you so much. That's it for me. Um, and I will turn it over to Ollie. Hey, Lauren. Thanks for your presentation. Thanks for the accessibility in your presentation too. So I wanna describe myself as well. And then you can't really see me. Um, hello everyone, welcome. Super honored to be a part of this conversation. My name is Alejandra. I am wearing a black shirt um, with a little rose, a red rose showing, some gold bamboo, red lipstick, team red lipstick today. Um, curly, big, puffy hair, um, and behind me is like some yellow background sitting on my brown couch. So welcome here to this space where we're talking about something super important. Uh, uh, again, my name is Alejandra, she, hers, pronouns, I'm out here in Atamlan, Yaquilan, we call Phoenix, I'm from Tucson, Arizona. Um, I'm a community organizer, particularly at the, at the intersections of immigration and, and criminal injustice. I call myself a reproductive justice storyteller. I share my story of, of having my abortions and also about being incarcerated and going through a deportation proceeding as a form of resistance, as a form of normalizing and destigmatizing something forced upon me, right? The state sanctioned violence. Um, and gosh, I'm just so honored that I'm here with Dr. Dr. Jamila and Lauren. I mean, I learned a lot, so I hope y'all learn a lot. I'm constantly learning how, you know, how to talk about, you know, this autonomy, right? The self-determination that I, that I was born with, but I was ripped, you know, ripped away from. 
policies and because of what y'all heard today. So I'm just really honored to be amongst y'all. So, um, you know, my role today today is just to really share as a person who's been, you know, in and out of en encounters with police, with court system, with enforcement, with like, ongoing terror of being ripped away and uh, separated from my family. Um, you know, I'm gonna come to this, you know, as to why people would, you know, choose to self-manage. I want to also acknowledge that, you know, I have, I have privilege. I have a lot of privilege and I'm here because also the people who actually have had SMA, um, you know, also can be here to share their, their story, right? Because of what we are just sharing, the criminalization of because of protecting, you know, them. Um, and again, my privilege also just even accessing uh, reproductive health care, you know, because of my language, for example, is a privilege. Um, I think that's one of the, the things we talk a lot about, um, you know, when we talk about accessing some of the rights we have. Um, so I'm just really honored and, you know, just to be here and share a little bit, you know, especially um, for folks that, you know, again, because do we do to protecting our communities, you know, we can all, we can't all share. Um, so yeah, again, um, you know, I shared a little bit, I just want to, you know, really share that again, this criminalization, um, you know, experience of again, for example, immigration status is criminalized, right? Just like, for example, oh, a little nap, I pulled it. Um, you know, abortions are criminalized in a certain state or not, right? Yeah, bring on the slide, actually. Thank you so much. <laughs> I forget I have slides. Yes, yeah, so these are some of the reasons why we self-manage, why people self-manage, have not. Um, so yeah, let me go by the slides. Um, so um, uh, again, um, immigration status, for example, when I think about, you know, uh, abortion also as something that's being uh, criminalized, um, even though um, it is legal, we still criminalize it, right, try to take away those, those uh, laws at a state level. But when it comes to immigration, right, that's automatically, if you're not a citizen, that's already automatically uh, breaking the law. So your whole existence as a person is, is illegal, right? So we're talking about you as your human, your, your whole self, you're illegal just by being here. So um, constantly, I know that I can be, for example, picked up, a knock on the door, right? My mom gets super triggered every time she's around me because she knows that, again, I have a public case, I'm fighting deportation, immigration is flat down, um, you know, illegal, it's a crime, right? It's a crime, they criminalize the sense of being here. We didn't con consent to that, right? I don't like to even call myself undocumented because I'm really documented, actually, if you think about it. I'm so more documented than a citizen because of the ongoing criminalization that I've had to face. So I just really want to talk about that because that is the family separation, right? Um, the police state, the collaboration with, with ICE La Migra. And at the end of the day, that's what we're talking about today, right? Mandatory reporting. Um, and that is through the police, through some sort of law enforcement agency, right? That is really disconnected from the actual community or the actual people. Right? And sometimes these, these um, also um, folks not really understanding the language to just how systemic racism, systemic, you know, poverty has hit us, right? And we have these biases, right? And we encounter certain people in the, in the medical industrial complex, right? That have biases like folks shared before me, just against just people making decisions over their own bodies and deciding not to be parents, right? Um, so I think those biases also come in play and it's very delicate. So I think those are the reasons why some people don't want to um, go there or participate. They don't have good experiences, right? Um, oh, let's go back still. Yeah, yeah. Um, they don't have good experiences, right? Again, we have to travel really hard. Here in Arizona, where I'm from, we have really little clinics, right? Small clinics where people have to come from out of town to, to come here. And again, traveling is the thing, right? So I think, again, the experience of being incarcerated or currently incarcerated, right? Having that police state over you, you don't really don't have agency. Um, we think about young people in this moment where sometimes they've been taken away their autonomy, their self-determination when young people are making decisions, right? Sometimes even better than us adults, right? But we don't trust them, right? Because we always give the sort of, we give, the knowledge to law enforcement or the medical industrial complex, right? When they're very racist, right? And they don't treat people the way that we want to be treated, right? We're not safe there, right? Um, so I think, yeah, some of those are the, some of the reasons why people decide to do this on their own, right? Obviously, the cost of an abortion, which is outrageous, we, we should be demanding free, accessible, um, and, um, and legal abortions, 
right? It's not a loan to have a right. We should be given the access and like, again, the means to get these, uh, this other part of our healthcare. It should be another part of our healthcare. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Thank you so much. And let me know if I'm going too slow. I mean, too fast as well. Um, so yeah, it's something like that, um, that I do also wanna um, just add again, it's um, people are also, you know, come home if you're not incarcerated or also you may be in deportation proceedings, but you also may be on, pro on parole or on probation, right? So you know that any interaction with law enforcement can get you in trouble. And when you think about a hospital or, uh, you know, putting your story out there when you're interacting with the healthcare system, people also think about that and that strays them away from participating in the in the industrial complex, right? So again, making decisions for what's best. We're, the, we're our experts and we make decisions, right? And so, and most of the times we consult with our communities, right? Um, so yeah, again, a lot of discrimination, a lot of misgendering out there, a lot of reasons why people don't want to go to a hospital. So why is mandatory reporting harmful? Um, this is really, really great. Uh, um, again, always talking about our stories and about how we criminalize, whether, you know, we're loud mouths, right? Whether we're uh, people helping, you know, um, you know, people doing anti-police work, for example, advocating for people who've been harmed by police, whether by uh, police uh, murders, right? Or by, or by police harming people on, um, on our streets that are unsheltered, right? All of those advocates, if we speak up, um, we get criminalized. So I just think even just mandatory reporting brings up a lot of trauma. So particularly, I wanna just talk about, um, again, how you particip we participate in the police and the state and the state by, re by mandatory reporting, right? It takes away um, also the, the, con the, the consent, right? It, it, it really violates uh, privacy between this person who sometimes are undocumented people, for example, right? And people make assume that we don't have an understanding of our, our bodies, but again, we make decisions over ourselves daily. Right? We're, we're starting families. We're out here living our lives as undocumented people, as quote unquote illegal people. There's 11 million plus of us, right? And yet we make the decisions over our families and we take care of each other. So to assume that you have to like, you know, again, like how Lauren was saying, was saying that you actually have to report, right? Or that, you know, yeah, you have you have an idea of what's happening. Don't do that, right? Like we um, we are complex beings and we are making those decisions. And I think again, family separation happens at the police state level, right? Family separation happens when somebody thinks that they're making a decision for somebody. When once you call the police, you no longer can make sure that those people are are out of the harm's way, which initially might have been a person's thought, right? So I think obviously, again, it allows people to be criminalized, right? People might have a background, people, you know, it, it, uh, those interactions um, can really put people in harm's way again by not knowing the full story, the complexity, right? And then also the way that the carceral state extends, extends into all our layers of our communities. Um, again, mandatory reporting is just racist, xenophobic classes. It makes, again, a lot of assumptions and endangers people. Um, you can go on to the next one. And also, I know that y'all are seeing here uh, the logos uh, from here from We Testify. I am also a We Testify storyteller. Um, I wanted to thank, thank all of the, the femmes, women, women of color, gender non-conforming people that are part of my cohort, part of the storytelling community with Renee. And I've learned so much about, you know, the agency that I carry, you know, to really um, keep sharing my story so that others share stories with us. Um, and again, um, at the end of the day, we are all abolishers. We want to abolish the systems that harm us. We want to create new, new systems, new communal, new trusting relations with each other so we can really address what are the harms and how can we make sure the harms don't happen again? Because we have to understand that not everything that harms us, right? The things that mostly hit our home are illegal sometimes, right? And the police don't solve that. And then, you know, most of the things that are illegal don't really harm, right? Like, if some people are smoking a joint somewhere, leave them alone. We don't need an alternative for that. And we see that reality already for white people. But again, we don't see that for other folks. And we want that for us too. So why do we need care and not cops? Again, um, you see here, uh, keep Ale free. That's my campaign to make sure I stay out of a detention center again. Um, you know, definitely trying to um, abolish uh, immigration customs enforcement because they are only here to target, deport, and incarcerate our communities, right? And um, either you, you know, either you're a legal permanent resident or not. The people that I met inside were people that needed support, right? That needed um, 
mutual aid that needed food that needed livable wages right that needed mental health care right that needed the u.s to stop intervening in their countries and making them even more poor that they needed to come here right where we welcomed them with more cages where we deny asylum right so we have to understand that we come from a very carceral state a carceral uh, policy driven where we're making profit of our, our cages, we're making profit out of people's harm, and um, we're giving populars a go every day, right? And these are also ICE agents, a rogue at the border, border patrol agents, right? So I think, um, you know, I'm also a Mi Gente member. We are organizers that are uplifting, you know, policies for the Latinx community. And we have a whole policy agenda of how we can abolish ICE, how we can um, really, you know, talk about the whole system as a whole, um, where even at the, at the border, there could be rescue support there, right? We don't need agents slashing water gallons, right? We need people to be supporting the migrants that are coming because we understand that there's poverty out there, right? That there's systemic violence and that we're investing in militarization of the world and caging of the world um, when there's poor people, right? When there's people looking for work and food. Um, and here we see that even when people speak up, when they understand and they have the, the support and the bravery to share about, you know, the violations of their bodies, right? When we heard, everybody heard, and I hope if y'all haven't to go look up the, the hysterectomies of the women and the doctors who spoke up, who spoke up about the hysterectomies that were that were um, happening at Urban at Detention Center, a, a prison, an a prison for immigrants. Um, and this, uh, this person that you see here pictured, not only she spoke up and the next day she was de deported, right? Doc, uh, Dr. Dawn spoke up and she was not protected, right? We are not protect, we are not really protecting. We think we're, we're trying to, you know, avoid harm, but we're actually harming more people, right? Pop, uh, doctors are protecting each other, right? Doctor, uh, you know, seeing Dawn share about this, right? We saw that she wasn't protected. That, we're, that, the, that the doctor was, was st it's still safe, still hasn't been charged, right, uh, or whatnot. So we still the same the same culture, right, the, of police protecting each other, and then the doctor, the industrial complex having the doctors protect each other and violate people's um, um, autonomy, right, D deciding that they're not good enough or they're going to be a tax, a tax um, baggage or whatnot, right. So I think. Um, you know, again, this whole system as a whole, we, are, we, we do this work because we want to create what works for us and abolish what doesn't. And that involves the industrial complex. It involves um, colonization of our care, that care that we've been doing in our communities for so long, right? And I think, again, what's really important about, about um, reporting is that you're not just implicating that person, you're implicating a whole community that's protecting them, right? The whole community uh, that has been, you know, doing, um, taking care of each other for a long time. So let me see, I don't know if I have much time. Uh, I think I have one more slide, but let me see what I'm missing out here. Yes, and again, I know that I, I don't have much to add around the family separation piece around child protective services, but again, people, you cannot, uh, you cannot make assumptions for people. You cannot take away people's power to decide over their own lives, right? If you, you know, if you, if you wanted to work in the medical field, you're here to just support and, and reduce the harm. Like I heard some language here. Um, but again, these mandatory uh, report, reporting only protects hospitals. And again, as businesses over people, we have to understand that, that we are people in need of like support and transformational support. Um, so here we have uh, why, how you can be an ally, how can you be supportive? Um, you know, when the one thing that came up to mind when we were putting this together was just, you know, also know your rights, right? If you're in, in, in this field, if you are a first responder to people uh, uh, that are the most impacted with mandatory reporting, know your rights as to what you can and cannot do. So that's why I think Lauren and Dr. Jamil for what you shared, it was very comprehensive. I feel more equipped. Um, I'm a, an abortion doula. I do technical support, emotional support out here in Arizona. Here you see a flyer of TAS, the Tucson Abortion Support Collective, which is in Tucson, where I'm from, people that I've been learning from, we're trying to replicate a whole collective of people that can support uh, people having abortions. Um, so donate a collective, support it, donate to a local abortion fund. And again, one thing that we can do is start uh, demanding to abolish the police, abolish ICE, 
that is the most that is the the one way right now that even at the local level people are talking about how do we allocate resources to what we really need right which are um i know sometimes i know here we're fighting for doula work and midwife work to be a part of like insurance for example right so again um uh really following the frameworks of reproductive justice which is about self-determination making our own decisions or over our own bodies and when there's mandatory reporting, that's literally a threat to making our own decisions through our own body. Um, and again, I just don't want to repeat anything else. The people that are inside cages that are that are that are the, in the most need of having, you know, these decisions respected, are the people um, that need your support the most. You know, so I just want to say thank you to everyone. Uh, do not call the police. Um, join your local fight uh, to to see reproductive justice attained in your own state. Thank you so much, Ale. Um, Dr. Parrott, if you wanna come off video for our question portion, um, we, we wanted to make sure and leave plenty of time for questions, but I also want to um, encourage us to take care of ourselves. I know that being at a virtual conference means a lot of Zoom. So I'm just gonna encourage folks right now to either move in a way that feels good or even just close your eyes so that you're not looking at a screen for just one minute. So do what you need to do to uh, keep it sustainable so that you can be present here for our um, question and answer period. All right. So um, yeah, I, I am so curious about um, if folks have any questions, are there things that you really wanted to know that you haven't heard from us yet? And um, if you could pop those where we have a Q&A or you can um, pop them in the chat. And in the meantime, um, while we're waiting on those, I'm just gonna go back to a slide I missed and see if maybe it spurs any questions for folks. If I can find it. There we go. Oh, Ali, please do. Oh, no, I was just, I mean, that's basically it. Um, but I really like talking about that policing culture because that still happens, right, even in our in our own communities, um, always that innate, you know, feeling when we're supporting others to, to, to police each other too, right, and to take some of those societal ways that we, we've been ta taught to watch each other and not just see each other as actual full human beings who, you know, are, are going through this complex world. Um, so I think that's a very, that's another thing that mandatory reporting really pushes you to keep on that policing culture, even, even if you don't, right? And I think sometimes the people that might not want to do mandatory reporting, right? Because of like, I don't want to invade somebody's privacy are also, you know, having to either like face like losing their job or whatever, right? So I think it's just, it's just not not it's something that we should have period right like i think the person the person seeking the support you know um it knows best and will ask for that help and will let you know right and stuff like that so um yeah. that's just it i think so too and i love what um what ali said about we we're consulting our communities right there's this idea that um healthcare providers need to to try to make decisions to keep people safe in some way that they have that we have no knowledge or grounding in what's happening with their lives if i don't if i don't help them and support them and and report them right then who who will do that work right and i think that that ties a lot to what ali is saying about policing each other understanding mm -hmm. that nobody is making decisions about abortion whether it's self-managed or an in-clinic abortion in isolation patients are people are consulting their communities and their support system we have wonderful abortion doulas like Ali who are out there in the community providing that kind of support. And so there is no need for you to call the police. There, it's not doing what you think it's doing. It's not serving the good that you think it's serving. It is only causing harm. And I think that that's really one of the most important things to take away. So thank you, Ali, for saying that. I think that was really important. And again, shout outs to the people who, who you know, have to figure that out, right? And are protecting those people, you know, because, you know, they won't be protected either, right? Mm -hmm. They will be criminalized, right? Right now, we're even just reminds me of like right now we're dealing with protecting the protesters as they're, you know, out there protesting for peace and justice, right? And getting gang charges, right? Being criminalized, um, you know, and it's no. So we have to just rebuke that culture and and mandatory reporting is just and the whole carceral culture and other. And I I don't know about y'all, but I didn't consent to police my my community, right? I want to support in here. Right. And even if I may not make the decision to do an SMA, I want 
you know, those people to make those decisions and be and, and support the people that need to, to have that, right? That need to do that. Yeah. So please, even go ahead. I'm sorry, Lauren, please. I was just gonna say I think that the 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 whole conversation around mandatory reporting as an issue like fits so squarely right into the conversation about abolishing police and um, defunding the police because it's really about um, that connection to the state and how do we find alternative systems of care and support that um, that really are out there in ways that Ali was talking about, right? Where it's community supporting community. And obviously I'm an attorney, I'm not gonna tell anyone to like not follow their obligations. And I know that there are folks out there who are doing work on civil disobedience and what that looks like. And I also know that there are folks out there who are doing work on, you know, can my agency employ a person who is not a mandatory reporter that can be sort of the first line that somebody can talk to first and they can so they can really share their story because we know that one of the things that mandatory reporting does is that it discourages people from telling their full story it discourages them from really being able to tell you what happened so i mean this is why like folks are showing up um, at emergency providers right and um, they're scared they're not sure if they can say that they self-managed. They're not sure if they can say that they miss, that they're having a miscarriage. Like it's just scary out there. Um, and I want to just plug um, one thing. It's um, called the MA Hotline, and it is staffed by, um, I believe, mostly physicians. Um, and you can call that if you are um, self-managing and you need support, right? So if you're worried about um, if you're having bleeding and you're not sure if it's a normal amount of bleeding, you can call that hotline and they're open to talk to folks about SMA. And then also just another plug for the Repro, Repro Helpline um, before folks SMA, that's somewhere they can call to talk about what the, what the risks are and what their rights are. I'm going to put the link to the MA hotline in the chat for anybody if you want to. So I'll pop that in there in, in a second. The other thing, and I think the, you know, you can call that hotline, certainly if you're self-managing an abortion or if you're having an abortion with medication and you're not sure you want support, more information. So um, there's a wealth of information that they can provide in a confidential way. So that's definitely an option. The other thing that is important to know is if you do find yourself in need of a medical provider, if you need to see your, your provider, if you need to go to the emergency room, um, a couple of important things to know. It's your right to tell them as much or as little information as you find important or necessary and that keeps you safe. The other thing is that if you use the, um, if you're self-sourcing your, your medication for medication abortion, there's no way that the healthcare provider knows that you're self-sourcing these medications or that you've gotten them from another healthcare provider or that you're just in the middle of a miscarriage. So there is no blood test, there's no exam that can tell that you've taken these medications, right? And if when how has a wonderful resource uh, for folks that are, um, are um, wondering what to do, what to say and how to move through the process. So I would encourage you to, to look into that as well. This is a quiet group today. I'm not seeing any questions. Maybe One thing that I want to share also, Lauren, is that when I was inside of detention center, you know, what, what I took most from it was really hearing the stories of like when I shared my work of like, God, this is not, um, sharing my work around like abortion access and just like immigrant rights and all of that good stuff, um, you know, people, you know, I remember meeting Diana, who was definitely like, wow, you know, she was like, I just would have never really thought that people like you existed talking about owning your body like that, or knowing policies and the rights and having a community, you know, she was like, I have five children that I'm being separated from right now. She goes, maybe it wouldn't be five children if I would have known that I could make better decisions because I've been struggling my whole life. Right. And she loves her children, but she was able to just be like, wow, this information, this be this, this be able to story tell and talk and hear it from somebody that's in detention with me, right? Um, it really, really impacted her. And I think about her a lot all the time. And, and I just want to show that the, the people in there are again making decisions over their own lives constantly every day. And you know, nobody, you know, we you know, nobody else has the power to to do that for anybody. Just even at the most. Uh, you know, even at the, at the, at the most, just, I don't know, at these intersections of like, for example, people in detention in cages or being shackled while being pregnant, like they're still making their decisions and we may need to support that they make their own decisions for themselves. 
And I think that's the biggest thing as to somebody who does a lot of interpretation work and translation work as well, and talks about language justice, like how to make sure that the, the playing field is equal, right? That we just don't come in with our complex savior asses and just like try to like say, like people can make those decisions when we just talk to them and are clear. And, you know, there's that access and that information. And yeah, I hope I was kind of clear. Not seeing any questions, so I think we just we we told them everything we needed. Oh, Jules, no, please, no other questions are coming in, so please ask all your questions. Hi, okay, y'all are absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for everything that you said. Um, just wow, I have been looking for these resources, and I feel like even looking for them, I haven't found these. I found others and they may have holes in them. And so those holes, you know, haven't been filled. Um, and this particular organization, um, the SMA hotline, well, I guess it's a hotline. Um, I, I guess, what is the, um, the, how, how is it accessible to people that may not have, um, I guess, the abortion providers nearest to them, so, or, or, or close to them? If, if people are in a state, let's say, where abortion access at a clinic with a counselor is, you know, um, maybe that time is cutting into, you know, the time sensitivity of it, or maybe it's, you know, culturally like defiant. How can you, um, I guess like the, I, I was desperate for information like this and, and I couldn't find it. And I have, you know, I have a community of people on the internet and off the internet. So yeah, I guess my questions are kind of all over the place, but um, can, can any of you speak to the SMA hotline um, in, in greater detail? So when you say SMA hotline, are you talking about the MNA hotline? So the one with um, doctors that talk? Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah. Sorry. I'm Sorry. Leave that to Dr. Parrott. <laughs> so um, it's a volunteer hotline. So doctors um, donate they their time and they just have, they field questions, right? So it's not a way to access um, medication to, to manage your own abortion, um, but a way to answer any questions if you're having an abortion at, so at home or um, if you're having a miscarriage, you're not sure how much bleeding is too much bleeding or whether or not you should be having this much cramping. If you wanna know if you should go in to the, um, to the hospital, if you're not sure about the timing of taking the pills, right? So it really is just a medical support, right? A place to call um, to talk with providers who um, can help walk you through the process in that way. Um, there are other hotlines that are available for folks that are accessing pills outside of the medical system, but that's not one of them. And it's tricky, right? You have to be careful about um, accessing lots of things on the internet because there's always a trail, right? And so one of the things um, that we have to think about when keeping yourself safe, if you're, self, if you're ordering medications over the internet or online, and you fall into um, this trap of being criminalized and surveilled, right? Then the paper trail um, can be there. So it's important that folks are doing their due diligence to make sure that the websites are encrypt encrypted, that they have the protections in place because the it, it is the legal risk that is greatest for people. And that's what has um, allowed the state to collect evidence and to weaponize it against folks that are making decisions for themselves. That part. That part about mandatory reporting allowing folks, the people we don't want to have this data, to start criminalizing the data, right? The criminalizing what the community's already knowing, or, you know, it just, again, too much information for literally the people we don't want to have it, also. Mm -hmm. um, that part, shout out to you. Yeah, and I just want to point out too that um, where folks live is not necessarily a protection from being criminalized, right? So we've seen criminalization happen um, in quote unquote blue states as well as red states, right? We've seen we've seen criminalization happen in states that have very few restrictions on abortion 
and in states that have a lot of restrictions on abortion. So it's really about individual prosecutors. Um, and it's also about that individual person and whether they had an interaction with someone that meant that they got reported to law enforcement. So there's lots of like factors, I think, that come into that. Again, my mandatory, yeah, reporting is anti-abortion, period, like anti-autonomy, period. They're working in cahoots. It's like, if you don't fit in these binaries, right? If you don't want a parent, right? You are a threat, right? If you don't want a parent. Like the world can be flowers and I don't want a parent. Like you all need to understand that also, right? It's got this complex out of you that we just have to become parents when our when we have these reproductive organs and that's not true um, either. I got excited, I forgot. No, I love that. I love that you're bringing it back to the point that this is all anti-abortion behavior. It's not about the specific practice of managing your own abortion because people manage their care in lots of ways all the time, right? You don't go to the emergency room or to the doctor every single time you have a headache, right? right. You go, you get some Tylenol, you get ibuprofen, you lay down, you take a rest. You make that decision about when you want to interact with healthcare providers. So managing your own care is not a new practice or a new process. And having abortions is not a new practice or a new process, right? But the, the point is that is exactly what Ali is saying. This is all an attempt to end all abortion, period, stop, right? That's what the goal is above all. And this is being used as one way to do that. Yeah. So what I was going to say is that, yeah, that part around like, again, it's about being anti-abortion. It's about telling people what to do for their own bodies. It's about population control. It's about telling like who lost for who, right? So I think it's bigger. It's against fighting the systemic of like, no, actually we have autonomy. We have a say no longer will these people that are so far from us and from the results and the answers and the needs that are making decisions over us, you know? So um, yeah, that part. I think Jules had another question. Jules, if you want to ask. Yes, Jules. Yes, thank you for allowing me the space. Um, I guess one of my questions would be kind of in response to a comment that I saw in the chat um, and just wanting to know what y'all have to say. But, um, and I'm not sure, Yanka, if you aren't comfortable with me bringing this up, please, please feel free to say so. Um, but you mentioned, I actually see the opposite more in the fields I work with and study in, a lot of white middle-class families severely endangering their children and the community and law enforcement doing nothing. And what, what I think of when I read that is, well, policing is inherently white supremacist. So if you have that system functioning with with those that it serves, then, then yeah, there's going to be those left out in in that community. But it's not, it's it's just so nuanced. And I guess in terms of, you know, family planning, in terms of keeping family safe and um, autonomy against the police state, how? How or what do you, what do you think about about that? What do you think about that world existing? I mean, are you asking me or are you asking the panelists? The the panelists, and then also like if you have anything that you want to add, like just leaving that open. So I think it is a thing that can exist for sure, right? I I don't you know. Just because it's not something that we've known in our lifetime doesn't mean that it is um, that it, it doesn't exist because it's not the right thing, right? When you look at actually outcomes of mandatory reporting laws, um, even for child endangerment, and look at the the data objectively, you see that the benefit isn't it's not there, right? It causes much more harm than it does um, provide care um, for the folks that we think that we're protecting. And the same thing happens in in cases like interpersonal violence or or folks that show up to the emergency room and mandatory reporting that's tied to gunshot wounds, right? And so understanding that the, the question for me becomes, what is it that we're really trying to do? In the case of reporting for child abuse, what we're trying to do is to provide protections for this family. And so instead of calling law enforcement, what does it look like to actually build systems that support this family in community, right? What does it look like to, pro to provide that infra infrastructure 
those social supports, money, resources, food, right? Often in child abuse and endangerment cases, um, neglect is conflated with poverty, right? And so um, instead of providing um, an income for that family, instead of providing financial resources, clothes for the children, food for the family, then we call law enforcement. Instead, in the family is separated and taken away. So I think it is a thing that absolutely can exist. Mandatory reporting laws have been around for certainly more than 50 years, but it's not always been the case. And just like these laws were put into place, they can also be removed. Right, And so we need to organize and advocate for their removal and not assume that they have to be there. Mm. Yeah, that's it. I mean, the first thing I thought about was just like, okay, so then literally like mandatory reporting and policing doesn't really help, right? Literally, like it was just it's evident that if it doesn't, it doesn't help, it's not the answer, it's not the solution. Right. And I think, but again, that's a society that invests in militarization and like colonization as its value, right? It, it inherently has to advocate for that and has to tell you that it's only a hammer and it sees everything as a nail type stuff, right? When we're saying, nah, actually, and we want to start making those decisions when people are harmed and when, you know, we want to ask them what, you know, we want to have that conversation with that person, right? Um, and then, like, how do we again talk about what are the things that's needed so that? that harm doesn't happen again, right? Or, or whatever it is. So I think it's just about us really thinking we have autonomy, we can make decisions for how our communities thrive and take care of one another and where the resources go and allocations. So it's all a big umbrella, right? For like the, the people to be, the people over prof, profit, people over property, right? And, it, and it's about us and about us having that agency and having that power, um, yeah. And, and again, again, it just, it fails. If it fails some people, it fails all of us, right? It's just not good enough, period, period. So yeah, absolutely. We should be those, we should be trying to defund the police, especially because people are being left out. Right. Yeah, um, can I reply to the mention of my comment? Yeah. Please. Sure. Yeah, hi, um, so my name is Ianka. I'm a recent graduate of Hampshire College. Um, this wasn't what, it wasn't what my um, div three was about, but I'm currently studying something called organized abuse, which are basically when abuse is intentional and takes place in a network with like basically uh, two or more adults. Um, and typically, organized abuse cases are like police often don't actually address them or deal with them. Like a lot of people who will try to report, like let's say they had images of their abuse online, will try to tell the police that it's online and, and to like, take it down, and nothing happens. Like a lot of times with organized abuse, there are people who are trying to reach out for help and because their family has affluent, they can't get that help or because like the police don't have training how to deal with it. So like, it's kind of a type of inverse thing where like, instead of having over-policing, there is a complete lack of any like response from a community or from police. Cause like a lot of times, um, survivors of the kind of abuse have symptoms. Um, DID is very common. OSDD is also very common. Those are dissociative disorders that the community don't actually know how to deal with or respond to. And um, so, yeah, so just like kind of, it, it's always kind of intense hearing about like, you know, both over-policing and lack of and lack of policing because like, yeah, it's, it's, a, hard, it's a hard topic I'm, I'm researching. I hope that was, I hope that's coherent. Yeah, that was helpful. And I think it's a good example of how the police don't really serve any of us, right? So like, it doesn't really, um, you know, obviously there's discrimination in policing. And I think it's a good example of like, you know, even in, like you said, middle-class white families where, you know, ostensibly that's who they're supposed to be protecting and they still don't do that. Um, so yeah, thank you for sharing that. I want to name it 502. So I think that means we should probably wrap up but uh, really, really, really appreciate um, the panelists, my co-panelists today. Um, thank you so much, Jules. Thank you, Yanka, And thank you to everybody who uh, came out to, to watch us. So hopefully uh, we'll be able to connect with you all throughout the conference and have a great evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. I hope you get that, that nat, Ollie, that I, you've been I, fighting I with. <laughs> Bye.